Fritz Kage's oh. offices Zoom meetings about their new um, the new um, tax property tax um, assessment formula model. Yeah, thing. and and yeah. it's just holy camoly is it complicated? But um, I have a I was talking to a guy who has a client who's looking to purchase a condominium building and convert it to rental. And so I was explaining that it would be covered by the inclusionary housing ordinance. But I said, and there's some other things you ought to know about. So I, <laughs> I figured I better get smarter on it. I know, <laughs> I don't know all the details, but you know, it's, uh, we are tier three based on our lack of affordable housing. So um, mm -hmm. developers can get the best property tax reductions. So that's something we want to weave into our update of our inclusionary housing ordinance because it could really be a game changer, you know? Yeah, and we can shift that uh, some of the money to the county rather than uh, uh, to, to us giving the money. I wonder, is that, has that, uh, has that, when is that workshop or when is that uh, presentation? Um, it is uh, literally being done, there, there are, are about five different ones. Um, mm -hmm. The one I was looking at is on March 1st, because it is for people who are considering um, providing affordable housing and how they can, how they can uh, uh, find out what it would do for them. Um, there's just, there are like five different versions. There's something for the current class nine buildings, how they should mm -hmm. handle it. And so um, if people are interested, I can certainly send out the, send out the um, website for it, but. Yeah, that sounds interesting. Bit, I will be happy to do that. It's a little mind boggling. Um, <laughs> but the, the people who, there are people and, and our tax credit projects are also going to be able to apply for a tax reduction, which is important because right now they are on the tax rolls, but you know, it, it can kill them because they, mm -hmm. their income is so restricted. Um, Another interesting thing is it's done only on the value of the building. The land is separated from the building. So, you know, our land is so expensive. That's one of our big problems. <laughs> but if we can get any reductions, it's, it's good. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe we have to reduce our uh, setback requirements for affordable units so we can uh, get more uh, building space. Exactly. Yeah. And I really, you know, Cambridge, Massachusetts had this wonderful, well, it, interesting thing. I shouldn't say wonderful because sometimes they can be with the best intentions, but I don't know exactly how it's working out. But they had a, what they did as an overlay for the entire city that if a building was 100% affordable, it got all kinds of waivers of, of, of stuff. Um, you know, <laughs> hmm. and I was like, ha, huh, I gotta see how that rolls out. Cause yeah, again, yeah. you know, they're a built up environment too. And they've got some of our same problems. Yeah. I'll say, I, I see council member Burns in the attendees uh, list there. Yes, I'm trying yep. to promote him to a panelist. Okay, oh, good. there he is. Like, yep. was it working for me for a minute there? I've been promoted. Yeah, I find the same thing. I click on the thing about admit, admit, admit about five times, and finally it does. Yeah. Um, Cherie Lackey also expressed interest in attending. I'm not sure if she's able to, um, but, but my hope is that she can. And Amanda, it's good to see you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm glad it worked out. I don't know if we want to um, give give Sheree another minute, or if we just sort of want to jump into the discussion. I can certainly frame 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 it if people would appreciate that, or <laughs> or not. <laughs> sure. Is, um, There's not a quick other weird thing. Um, we probably should have designated because it is sort of like a public meeting, a a a, a chair for the purpose of running. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so maybe we could have a volunteer to chair. <laughs> Amanda, would you like to be the chair? 
as long as I can, do I have to like follow the like Robert's rules? <laughs> can we just talk? It's a loose meeting. So yeah, yeah. It's just the, the, the three of us committee members and our two staff. So I think it'll be It's a discussion. Well. I think we can keep it really okay. loose. <laughs> I can handle that, I think. <laughs> sure. You don't even have to approve minutes, you know? I mean. Okay. <laughs> nice because I don't know how to indicate in the notes that someone was voluntold to chair. <laughs> Thank you for standing up. <laughs> is Demita coming or, or is it just Sherry? Um, so far it's, it's Sherry who, oh, who Sherry. Um, okay. yeah, Demita was not, did not respond affirmatively. Okay. Um, well, I know I'm going to have to go right at one. So maybe we should just jump right in and then um, if she comes, we can just continue. Um, yeah, so Jessica, if you want to kind of start off by framing this, you know, as I was kind of giving it a little bit of thought, I know we do have some parameters. We have a certain amount of money. We have sort of a target audience. We have some agencies already kind of lined up that could help us with this. And I think, um, you know, maybe if you start to frame it, we can kind of dig in with some brainstorming about the possibilities for this funding. Thank you. Yeah, so, so the goals as I see them, and I hope you see them also, are really twofold. Um, we do have applicants who did not fall under the categories of case management or safety net services. Um, and those applicants are waiting, waiting in the wing, as it were, to, to hear whether they're eligible for funding or not. Um, two of those applicants do provide mental health services, uh, but did not necessarily apply for mental health services um, in the way that I think the committee was, was looking for mental health service providers. So the committee agreed to focus um, support services on mental health funding or mental health supports. And I think specifically around, um, and, and again, I don't, I don't wanna put too many ties on it, but um, medical management was one of the areas, um, psychiatric, I'm sorry, excuse me, psychiatric services, diagnostic services, and, and counseling. Um, and I think people were most interested in like individual and group counseling and therapy. Mm -hmm. um, so we have Trilogy, uh, who, and Trilogy is a wonderful organization. They do offer those services, but what Just they because you go over that list one more time, the, you said medical management and um, individual and group counseling. What was the third and fourth? Sure, I apologize. I should not have said medical management. What I should have said was the three top areas of mental health needs as identified by our agencies are psychiatric services, diagnostic services and counseling. Medical management did come up, but it was not the top three. So we certainly can consider it. Benefits enrollment also kind of came up, although I, I don't think that that's mental health necessarily, but. Um, and just a note, our case management agencies for whom we're supposed to be doing this, these are supportive services for the clients in case management services too. So um, are supposed to be having that benefits enrollment component. So, you know, that's one of the ongoing challenges of, of making sure we're, uh, what we're trying to accomplish here. So these are the supportive services in the mental health area for the individuals and how families in case management is the first way we're looking at this as to, to implement the intent of providing access to services that these, uh, these um, individuals and families with complex needs require to move forward um, and uh, achieve wellness and stability and all that good stuff, but are facing barriers to accessing for, in many cases, the financial constraints and the wait lists everybody gets put on. Like if you, yeah, we take Medicaid, but we've got a wait list that is five times longer for Medicaid. So, you know, that type of stuff. So that's kind of the complexity of it that I think we're trying to deal with first. Could you, could you explain diagnostic and psychiatric just so I understand it in the way the agencies uh, understand it? Sure, uh, thank you for that. So psychiatric services include the ability to um, prescribe medication. 
Yep. And diagnostic services, people could present with what appears to be mental health issues, but un until they are diagnosed with either depression, anxiety, whatever the schizophrenic disorder or whatever the diagnosis is, until they have that official diagnosis, um, they are less eligible to receive services. So that diagnosis makes them more eligible to receive services from Trilogy or um, yeah, Erie or other, other providers. So, so they maybe they have, have, um, go through an assessment to, to rule out a medical concern, whether they need medication, what kind of diagnosis they might have. And then that would kind of um, allow them to seek other services. Perfect, thank you. And Amanda, there's, there's probably also people in the pool who don't have like a, a, like a persistent mental illness, but who are experiencing anxiety, depression, um, substance abuse, things like that, that you know, could also really benefit from mental health services. So I think, you know, I think we should also kind of include those folks in our, um, and they may be part of taking part of the, in the case management services that we're also talking about. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, and one of the things that we're hoping this working group or the, the committee explores is, you know, $200,000, it's not a lot of money. And so if the group wanted to sort of decide that the money would be for counseling services specifically, then, then how can we provide those services? Or if the group wanted to decide that psychiatric services, that the, the, the group wanted to focus that funding on psychiatric services. I think psychiatric services are also really expensive. Um, so, so it's twofold. It's what, what do we do with these applications that are kind of hanging out? And then based on these top three needs that agencies have identified, how do we want to focus funds? Where do we want to focus funds? <laughs> like, what are next steps? And I think the goal would be for, for the committee to, the, the working group to, to decide here and then present a recommendation to the bigger social services committee at the meeting in March. Yeah. Okay. And then nothing is off the table. You, you guys can decide, like, you love the agencies, even though they don't fall under case management or safety net, that these agencies have been waiting and they deserve funding. You guys could decide that, you know, not to, to not fund them and to move it in a different direction. You could decide to fund, you know, one or two or move it. There are do no we, options off the table. Do we know roughly what the need is? And, and I don't know if this is getting more into the the data, type of data collection that I would like to see moving forward or if we have the ability to understand the need in each area based on agency feedback, um, you know, especially for counseling, you know, like how, how often, how many referrals have they gotten in the last year that they feel they couldn't feel, you know, feel or find appointments for? Do we have any understanding of the volume of requests that are being, uh, that, are, that are going on field? So that's a great question. It is challenging because the, those populations sort of shift um, all the time. They're constantly kind of in flux. Um, but when the agencies polled included Connections, uh, the Moran Center, YOU, Infant Welfare Society, and they said for, for counseling, for example, there are always more participants than can, can receive access to services. And, and I think given our limited funds that what we could provide with the $200,000 if we were to put it toward counseling still wouldn't match the demand, but it would take, take a dip out of it. <laughs> if that... I, was, I was kind of thinking that we could um, come up with some kind of a model where you know maybe we are able to Okay, so I know like, for example, um, I wrote it down, one of the agencies, um, not Trilogy, but Impact, I think, you know, that they're providing mental health services, but maybe we also need to put out like some kind of an RFP to, and, 
or if we're going to expand it to see if there's other either private practices or other agencies that could provide some service. Because the issue is the wait lists and um, funding and maybe transportation could be an issue too, depending on where the, um, the agencies are. But then kind of come up with a model like we're able with this $200,000, we're able to fund five to 10 sessions at $100 a session for X amount of people, whether it's through a voucher or a direct contract with an agency. Um, and then we kind of serve folks with that money. Cause I agree, I think it's not a, a ton of money. And so we'd probably, the, the demand would exceed um, what we're able to support anyway. So maybe if we think about how to evenly distribute the money in a way that a session amount or what have you that could still be impactful, um, you know, maybe is one way to think about this. But I'd love to hear other people's ideas or thoughts about what could possibly work. Actually, I'm trying to understand where the where the gaps are, you know. So I wonder one gap that might be there is, you know, it seems like the more complex the trauma that the individual is going through, the harder it is to place those people. That was something that I heard from Audrey Thompson. But if there's a since we don't have a lot of money, if there's a particular area that's the hardest to place, um, I, I'd, I'd be interested to understand that to see if that's an area that we should focus our limited funds are, or do we want to just expand an area that is somewhat available where we can expand it and, and see a lot of benefit there. But, um, and I think that can, that, that could also align with what you're saying, Amanda, but within that, I'm just trying to see if, if we should prioritize around a certain need that we're seeing in the community within, you know, counseling. Cause it's family counseling, for example, is a, is a need within the need. Is that something that we want to focus this money on? For example, um, um, yeah, but that's, that's it. Sarah, I think I might have cut you off. No, that, that's perfectly fine. <laughs> you know, I should be cut off and let the committee speak. Uh, but not, but what I was going to do was support what Amanda was talking about. One of the things that we could try to do, which I think would be the best sort of financial agreement to, to do, given our limited um, you know, to build experience with this is to define things like, I mean, again, I'm not a practitioner, so I might not have all the terms, individual counseling and group counseling and have a cost associated for a certain amount of sessions. And, but, but what we could do is we could put, we would put out a sort of um, RFP to see if other providers would be willing to do this. Because one of the things we talk about is it's really important to see if private providers might be able to fill some of the gaps. And especially when we keep hearing that sometimes people don't find um, practitioners who they feel comfortable with. So, and, you know, Demita's talked very um, um, eloquently about that. Um, so if we could figure out a, your, your agency or you, your practice would be willing to do this much I mean, I don't even think it, everybody has to have the exact same cost, but we have to have a cost reasonableness. Um, the good thing is we're working with local funding. If it were federal funding, we'd have to put out a traditional you know, procurement and go with the cheapest one, no matter what. And that's one of the reasons we said this should be done with local funding because we, we need to have some discretionary um, you know, we, we need to have criteria other than just cost. Um, and so I, I think that that would be a very good way if, and, and this is why it's so good to have our practitioners like Amanda and Danita and, and others, because they can say, yes, maybe doing an X number of session um, cost would actually really move people forward. Um, and, and then we could say, okay, agency A, we can provide you up to you know this much money for up to these many individuals or households and depending one of the hardest things is everybody is suffering from being paid late by everybody um, one of the things that i would consider being a good way to do this is say okay we will give you I, i'm just making up for round numbers because it's easier if everybody's mm, service costs $10,000, I'm just 
again, using a round number. Um, and you say you can take 10 over the course of a year, maybe we would give them enough for five. And then when they have shown they've treated, you know, they've taken on that, those clients, then we could extend. So they're not always waiting for money. We're not putting checks on every bills list that, you know, is going to drive everyone crazy, but we can manage it. And that's really how we manage many of our grant. Um, I mean, that's how our grants are managed in a way. It's not like we wait for them to give us every receipt before we um, release their first funding, because that is very difficult for agencies. It's a cash flow thing. But, you know, we could work out something like that, which I think could be because um, if we make it too onerous from a payment standpoint, then everybody's going to go, no way. So, you know, we have to look at barriers both for getting people into services, but also things that make the providers go, oh, I can't possibly wait to have to file, you know, do X number of sessions with somebody and then be reimbursed for it. And, and, and I, I'm come, you know, they'll have to show us who, who was referred from whom or the referring agency will say, this individual, you know, this client has been referred and is taken as a client and we track it that way because then the provider, the support services provider has to also report without breaking any confidentiality, of course, on whether or not the client actually went through um, the sessions and stuff like that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Um, Sorry, Jessica, I see your hand is up. Thank you. I also wanted to address the idea of greatest need um, because when we're talking about psychiatric services, particularly for children, we hear from YOU and the social workers at the school district that that is a tremendous need. And a really big challenge is um, students who receive medication and then can't get psychiatric services to continue their medications. So they're bounced off of their medications, they're put back on the medications. That's a big need. We also hear from like connections and our homeless, our, our providers for homelessness services that diagnostic services are, are a big need. And oftentimes people present in case management, but without that, that diagnosis, they aren't eligible for deeper services with Trilogy or Erie or other organizations. And we know that counseling is a huge need. So I would encourage this body and, and the social services committee as a whole to, to maybe not look for the, the greatest need, but just sort of decide where we wanna focus our energies because that would give us the, the <laughs> permission to kind of move forward. Um, mm -hmm. It's one of our challenges. I guess and to take a step back, I wonder what is the outcome we're trying to achieve? And if it's to learn a little bit about how to do each one of those categories better, then I think we probably should do all of them. Um, if it's to get better at addressing uh, the greatest need, however we determine that, then let's just do that. But I, I feel like well, if we don't have enough money to really make a huge impact, really what we're doing is learning. This is a learning experience for us. It's providing care, of course, but it's also a learning experience so that we can we know how to make future investments and where there might be opportunities for structural change. And so I guess the question is, how do we want to learn from this and what is the best way to do it? Now, from what you said, again, it maybe it makes sense to just, you know, equally across the board, try to split this up where we have the same amount of funding in each one of those buckets so that we can learn a little bit about how to do each one well, and then talk a bit about how to do that. Like the, for diagnostics, does that look like someone, finding someone that's flexible enough to go out to uh, one of our um, uh, um, uh, homeless shelters and provide that diagnostic support right there at the site? Is that what that looks like, right? So that people don't have to go to an office to get that, um, that support. So. But once we figure out how we want to allocate the funding, then we can talk a little bit more specifically about what we're looking for. And then I think that'll help develop the RFP potentially. Yeah, I if think- If it's going to be an RFP, I don't know if we're doing RFQ, RFP, I, I get mixed up on all that. 
I, I think there's like two issues. One is there aren't, uh, there isn't enough service to meet the needs. We need to find more services. Um, so I guess that's where sort of the idea comes from about the RFP or whatever the correct term would be, but we need to find more providers of the service, whether it's counseling or doing assessments or providing psychiatry services. So I think that's one problem because th this is what our, our agencies are telling us. We have people with long waiting lists. There are services in Evanston or nearby, but there's just not enough providers to, to meet the need. So we need to find more providers and more agencies, and we need to find a way to disperse the money. So, um, so maybe to me, yeah. So maybe, I mean, like the first step is like just finding more people. We need to, to do that. And maybe that means funding some of the agencies that we already have kind of waiting. Um, because I think that's a good start. Um, but I think we also need to find more. Um, and maybe that's, you know, a way to talk about it. I don't know how people feel about this, but as I was thinking this through, I thought like, okay, we put out you know, a request for proposals from agencies and such. And then maybe there's some, you know, maybe there's a lot of like private practices in downtown Chicago or something. Well, how are people going to get there? You know, how are people going to get to Glenview or where, you know, wherever like some of these services are. Um, and so I just, I don't know how people feel about this, but there's a big push now. And there's also research that shows that it's very effective to do online um, treatment. So you know, maybe we can, you know, just kind of looking into a couple of these, um, they're providing telehealth and they're doing it on the phone through, you know, Skype or whatever, um, texting, you know, that, that could be another way to kind of increase the pool of service providers if we thought that that was something that we wanted to include. It's, it's easily accessible for those that have computers. Now, not for everyone. So I think we need to also have places that people can walk to and what have you. Um, but just one other idea. And then I think then secondarily, then how, who's gonna be eligible for this? Are we focusing on, and these are some of the things that you were talking about, Council Member Burns and um, Jessica and such. So, you know, who's gonna be eligible for this particular funding? Are we gonna try to do some of the diagnostic services and the counseling um, or, or what have you? And then, you know, to that point, uninsured versus insured, that was another question I had. Are we going to try to hit both groups or focus on the uninsured? Yeah, I think we should focus on the uninsured because they have no resource or yep. the underinsured. Right. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And I think that's going to be many of our, really most of our people who are in robust case management. I mean, the, 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 the theory is to, to really provide those people with the resources they need to, to make progress. And because we have such limited funding right now, I think it would be probably smart to try to focus on those groups. And we can also, we've already got the agencies working with them. So we, we will probably have a greater likelihood of being able to track something. And, you know, <laughs> Jessica and I have talked to some other organizations about the system we're trying to implement, they go, wow, that's really cool. If you can figure it out, we'd love to hear about it because it, it is complicated. You know, our, our social services funding structure is so fragmented and it makes everybody have to run around to try to find everything for themselves. And it puts the greatest pressure on the people with the least resources, financial, emotional, everything else to, to deal with it. And so, I think that if we can kind of keep it limited to that for a start, it will do what you're talking about, council member, which is- Are you saying, Sarah, or what are we talking about now? I just wanna make sure I'm following. Pardon? Keep it to what? What are, what are we keeping it to? You're recommending we keep it to the- we keep, Well, at least to the people who are in our case management programs that we're funding. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it, because I think that most of them are going to be uninsured because that's, you know, really who we're or or, um, or in a queue forever because they're, you know, at the back of the line of the Medicaid list, which I think it was, was it Erie, Jessica, who has different lists for different types of insurance and, and they have to follow that as a qualified federal health center probably. Um, and, you know, if we could get 
somebody started and then they could be transferred to Medicaid funding when they get to the point in the line where they're eligible for it. I don't know. That's something that we would have to talk to the billing people because you know that's easy for me to say, but it might screw up their billing. But I think that that's um, what we need to do. And, and I do think we could look at having a pot of money for each of these three categories, or we could start there and see, try that. And if we can't work it out, work it out for those we can. And Amanda, I like the telehealth. Um, so I just wanted to add a, an endorsement for that. I do like the telehealth as well as, um, you know, if there's a way where someone could provide, you know, diagnostic and maybe psychiatric treatment but, or services, but definitely diagnostic services at one of our Evanston locations um, and hold office hours there. Like, hey, can you go to Connections has several sites that, right. like, near downtown Everson, what does it look like to provide an office space for yeah. someone to provide diagnostic services as you know our, our uh, kind of housing home insecure population is coming in and out of a space they're already there they're already going through intake um, why not have someone staff there certain you know days of the week to provide diagnostic services right or be on call and be able to set up appointments quickly or something and go to their house or whatever and that was impact behavioral health specifically didn't apply in our other categories because their case management for their residents is funded through their supportive housing agreements. And so, you know, and, and of course that never covers everything, but you know, we're not using our money most of the time to cover every gap in everybody's funding that we try to be pay for, paying for everything. But they had said, we're interested in being a supportive service and and they do they are one of the organizations that can do that um uh, diagnosis and so they would definitely be you know somebody we could say hey what would let's work out a tell us what you could do you know and and we could we could have some kind of a how many people might you be able to diagnose or how many clients might you be able to handle in what period of time? Would it be at your at a specific location? Would you be willing to go to whoever, you know, whatever agency the client is with or do whatever, you know, that type of thing um, it, without making it too complicated. We'll have to get it down to something manageable, obviously. I can't just throw everything out there, but but I think that that is, is really important. And, and, and they, there have been cases where I know um, Connections, for example, has actually paid you know, gotten somebody at various points to be on available and come at certain times. And, and so that type of a thing of having somebody at a facility might be a really good thing too. Um, but I think that that would be a really good way to start on the diagnosis one. Um, and I, I absolutely agree that telemedicine, not only just for, uh, you know, there are some people who I've, uh, I understand are willing to do telemedicine telecounseling because they can do it in a very private way and they don't have other people seeing that they are going to you know mental health services or something that it, that it can be very important for people whose cultures stigmatize that um i come from minnesota and north dakota and they did a huge thing about in, in some stuff i was reading about how farmers who would never admit that they had a mental illness because that's a human failing in their view but also important was they're out on their farm all the time. They can't take a day to go someplace, but they can take part of their lunchtime and do a call. You know, so it, it, it's really, I think it's an amazing thing. It can work amazingly well. And, and we don't want to rule something like that out. That would be really, um, thank you for I think, bringing that up, Amanda. I think another nice thing about it is that they have so many um, different services that you can really have a, a wider variety of choice around picking someone that feels like a good match for you. Um, you know, like if going to Wilmette to see, you know, a particular therapist is not your bag, you know, you have other options, um, you know, in terms of race, ethnicity, background, the way they see problems, the way that they work for change, you know, all of those things. So I think that's another nice thing about it. There's a bigger pool. 
So it sounds like we're kind of shaping up some things. Oh, okay. Sorry, Jessica. No, that's great. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I love the way this, I, I don't want to stop this conversation, but I also, in considering how much time we have left, want to bring up those applications like Youth Job Center and Shore Community Services and Northwest CASA that, that maybe we can say definitively aren't <laughs> providing the services that, that it sounds like we're looking for. Would, would this group, what information could staff provide that would help this group make some decisions or recommendations around these applications? I mean, I think when we put out the RFP, if they feel they should apply, they should apply. I don't think we, we need to tell them that they, you know, aren't eligible at this point. They can make that determination for themselves once we put out the RFP or develop the RFP. I mean, that's my thought, unless we're trying to figure out another way for them to, to get funding potentially, which we may not know right now. Right, we're not, we're not trying to figure out another way for them to get funding. Um, but but we do have these applicants, they, they applied um, through Zoom grants and they're waiting to hear about those applications. Um, I guess what Jessica is saying is we had never officially said these agencies will not be funded based on these applications. And I think what you just said, Council Member Burns, is a really good point. Any of them, you know, I mean, I just look at the services we're talking about, the mental health services, and think, wow, you know, Impact, we know, wanted to apply for supportive services. And Trilogy has such a wide range of capacity. They may have all kinds of things that they could provide and in the mental health services we're talking about. Um, but, you know, um, some of the other providers, the, the fit isn't as obvious to me. But if we say, uh, if we were to say, you are not being funded under either of the categories that you'd applied for, you know, it, it, for those that applied, but any of you would be eligible to apply when we get these other RFPs out. That, that is a very, I think, appropriate way of, of, of communicating to them that, you know, so, but, but Jessica and I would just like to be able to say, no, you're not going to be funded for what you applied for in, the first it's, it sounds like that's the recommendation right that's that that yeah. you and jessica feel they don't they're not a necessarily a, a, a great fit for those other right yeah right yeah I, so i think that sounds right to me amanda i don't know if you have a i i agree because like reading through the information in the packet that you provided jessica it seemed like impact behavioral health and maybe trilogy could be eligible under these support services the way that we're talking about them now but the other ones less so so i'm in support of letting them know that but if certainly if they want to apply for like an rfp once that's developed i think that's certainly possible yes thank you thank you for that. so then what we would put on the um next agenda for the full committee is that um the uh, request that we formally decline funding those just so that it's clear to the agencies um you know the ones that did apply um, and not all of them did, you know, I mean, it, so this would apply to um, Trilogy, Northwest Casa, Shore, and Youth Job Center, I believe, right? Yep. Do we yeah. need to vote on that or can that just be an administrative no, we decision? We would okay. need to vote. The committee would need to vote. Oh, wow. Okay. That's because normally um, what we've always done in the past is when we used to have um, a funding night where everybody applied and then the committee would make their decisions. They, everybody would know right then if they were not funded because the committee would vote by voting who to fund. Um, the, uh, the people who were not funded were, you know, knew that they weren't being funded, but because we had this other category hanging out there. Um, right, right. I just think it, um, and, and we don't want to, we don't want them to feel they're kept hanging. And of course, you know, we're still working with um, many of them with other parts of our city and, you know, and other things, not just through this funding stream. You know, Youth Job Center is always working with our um, uh, youth services group. And, you know, the, so it's not like we're abandoning the agencies. They're very much a part of our service. But um, I just think it would be clearer and that would be a, a good thing. So. Okay. Yeah, I'm in support of that. Um, I have to jump in a few minutes, but I just wanted to say again, for me, I, I think 
the way I look at services is always trying to um, um, shorten the distance between where services are and where people are. And for that reason, you know, I really support, I like to, to do things where people already are, like uh, it's already a safe place for them and they're seeking services there, uh, which is why I, I really want to, again, highlight um, what Amanda said about telehealth. I think that's something that's, that we should, um, we should really highlight separate of office, you know, office visits in their office and separate from all that, we should make a clear distinction that we're all, we're looking for people to, to uh, we're looking to understand how much telehealth and, and also site visits to agency sites um, that people can support. And it's okay if it's like, look, we could do 20% of that and the other 80% they'll have to come to our office. Uh, we can do half and half, like it's fine if they can't do it, but I would like to, clearly distinguish those things because they are different and just know how, you know, if they have the capacity to, 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 to do each one, you know, what type of capacity right. they have each one. Right, right. And it may yeah. even be, you know, there could potentially even be a different cost because let's face it, one of the things about whenever you're traveling, there's <laughs> going someplace, there's a cost. I think that's a really good idea, Council Member Burns. And we can put that, what, what maybe, um, Jessica and I can begin to do is try to outline what we would ask applicants for each of the categories. And then I'll be frank, I would like our practitioners to maybe we may contact Amanda, you and some of the others offline just to find out about what kind of costs are normally associated with this. Cause we don't, I, right. I personally don't have any handle on that other than all we can do is look at what Medicaid pays. And we know that's not going to attract a lot of people to take stuff on, <laughs> on short term. <laughs> yeah. And I think too, we've already kind of, I mean, in this discussion today, we've kind of already identified some questions maybe for an application. Yes. Um, so that's great. So there's something to build there and even some ideas around maybe focusing on some of the diagnostic services, maybe somebody who's willing to provide some services on site and location you know, in downtown Evanston or at another agency. Um, so that's great. I feel like we have some good things to build upon and then maybe focusing on counseling. You know, medication, you know, the way our mental health system works is that most people do get their medication through their primary care doctor. Um, it's, you know, when you have more significant, you might be referred to a specialist, which would be a psychiatrist or a nurse practitioner. Um, so, you know, we may want to think about like eerie. I mean, my problem is they're probably like filled to capacity is my sense. So that's why you have to kind of look for new things, but maybe there's other, um, you know, so that, that piece about the medication, maybe that's something that with our limited funds, we don't focus as much on. Maybe we do want to focus on the diagnostic and the counseling, but I don't know. I mean, we can still obviously talk about this, but that, that might be the thing. Actually, Amanda, that's very helpful. It never occurred to me the thing about um, primary physicians are probably the first that, you know, I, I'm always thinking like getting a psychiatrist, ah, you know, yeah, uh, but. Well, actually, if I, if I could jump in and say, uh, North Shore University Health Systems here does have a program, the Bridges program, um, where they do medication management and um, they have a specific day, I think it's Tuesday, where they work with with participants who are not insured. Um, and I know this because this is where um, school social workers send a lot of referrals and Moran Center sends referrals. Right. And so one of, the, one of the things that could also potentially happen is that the funding we have, if, um, if, if psychiatric or medication management services um, was something that the committee had an interest in expanding, you know, we could work with North Shore University Health Systems and their Bridges program uh, to, to see about expanding services. Uh, I think Council Member Burns said earlier in the meeting that you know, we, we, there are a lot of partners in Evanston. There are a lot of agencies already doing the work. And while I am all for also uh, putting out an RFP, um, maybe it, it, these funds would be best used by expanding the work that, that some of these partners are already doing. The, the challenge, and I think for the work, the work of the, this body moving forward would be 
to work with staff to explore these partnerships and these agencies to see. And again, I don't want to take away from the RFP. Maybe we put out an RFP. Maybe we look at expanding partnerships. Maybe we sort of do both simultaneously. Yeah. Um, but but sometimes if it's just me and Sarah, <laughs> we yeah. need we need the expertise of you, Amanda. We need Demita. We need Cherie. We need you know um, Samantha. All of these different. Um, <laughs> all of your skill sets, all of your knowledge to, to um, put into this process because we can't. <laughs> we and I do think this is something where we can kind of do an outline for literally what we might, you know, and have our practitioners kind of tweak that because, you know, I mean, sure. council members, Reed and Burns, I'm happy to send it to you both too, but, you know, if somebody were to send something like that to me, I would be like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you may know much more about it than I, but, but you know, that we, but I think we can, we can start and, and do a sort of bullet point draft of what things we might think should be asked. And then, you know, we're not going to write a full, and, and I don't want to pretend that this is going to be like a true, you know, city of Evanston, normal competitive RFP, because it's, it's really a, um, um, I had to ex explain to some of our folks who are in public works and stuff that, you know, in the nonprofit world, you don't really, you don't try to compete. You try to work out ways to work together, but we do have to have some way of showing cost reasonableness. And that's, I think, really what this is for. And I think it's going to be eye-opening to people because most of us don't know that much about the costs. And, and it makes it very hard for us to understand what the, how, how deep the barriers are or how yeah. the barriers are. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I love the, I love all of these ideas. I feel like this has been a really productive meeting, like just sharing all of this. It sounds like we have a nice kind of outline of some ideas moving forward and just so appreciative of you, Jessica and Sarah, like being willing to kind of break it down and create an outline that we can, as a larger committee can consider also. Um, and I love the idea and I totally agree with what you were saying, Jessica, like if there's ways that we can build and expand, that is certainly easier um, but we also may need, you know, if people are at capacity, we may need to consider something larger. And so maybe doing those simultaneously, you're starting first with the expansion question and then, you know, seeing where that leaves us um, for other services. So, uh, yeah. So, so just to recap, we're putting out the recommendation to decline the applications because we're going to open up a new process. Um, and then uh, do we have a are we focusing on one area or multiple areas? I'm not sure that I. I, I'll say I, I, I sat silent most of the time and just listened, but I, I will say that I, uh, I, I agree with uh, the idea that Councilman Burns had, which is to, especially in this phase, uh, to just learn. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll second that uh, idea. We'll look at all three. Okay, we'll yeah. look at all three. Yep. Okay. We may find that we only have money to effectively do two, but that is an important learning if we're finding that with this much money. And, and, and I think this is partly gonna be, we're gonna to have to look at the number of clients we're talking about, you know, it'll be a little bit of, and it, it, it'll be rough at this point, but we've got to start, I, I think it's absolutely important that we try to learn from it. So we have a better idea on how to, what proportion of funds need to go to what in the future. <laughs> yeah. And thank you. And I was really just asking for accuracy of notes. Oh, I know. I know. always I'm tough just... to write up the recommendation from a group. Right. <laughs> <laughs> just want to make sure. Thank you, Council Member Reed. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, Council Member Reed, I just I noticed that you did unmute yourself a couple of times. I just want to make sure you had a chance to say all the things that you wanted oh, to say. No, trust me. I. Uh... <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, affectionate or uh, known uh, by Bill Smith as the most loquacious member of the city council. So, uh, no, if I, yeah, no, I, I have nothing to say. Okay. You would but let I us know. Would speak, I would let you guys know. Yeah. If I, gotcha. if I okay. I needed to speak. Okay, great. <laughs> um, well, I know we're just like winding down. I don't know if there's any last questions or um, thoughts or issues to discuss or anything at this point, but. Thank you both for your time. I appreciate council member Burns's time, but he, he's jumped off, but um, no, I think. You know, I think this really, really helped us 
And I think this is exactly what we want these little sort of working groups to be able to help us do because it's difficult to have some of these kind of roll up your sleeves discussions when you have a committee of, of, of eight and hopefully we're gonna get a ninth person assigned. We keep asking like, you know, we have one vacancy, <laughs> so we need to get them. But, um, you know, it's it's just one of those challenges. It's, it's... Yeah, yeah, this was great. All right. Good. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, everyone. Yeah, happy oh, Friday and have a great weekend. You too. Yeah, All right. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.